it is a great privilege for me to introduce my good friend, Charlie Ebinger. <clears throat> I met Charlie right at the beginning of school as we were both in the Morgan West entry. And I was on the third floor, Charlie was on the first floor. And uh, he roomed with Dave Prouty and their door was always open. So I would stop by uh, many times to talk with Charlie who always had something interesting to say. And Charlie has really been part of the glue that has held our entry together. Morgan West has more alumni here, I believe, than any other entry. I believe we have nine uh, here this weekend. Uh, so then Charlie moved on to Woodhouse, and I moved on to Fort Hoosick House. But in July of 1969, we had all been reading Arthur Romer's book, Europe on $5 a Day, and uh, we met in Pamplona, Spain, for the Fiesta of San Fermin with the running of the bulls. And we had read about this in James Mishner's book, Iberia, and, our, and Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, so we were prepped to run with the bulls. Well, Dick Cooch was there as well, and another fellow named Chip Patterson, who was a friend of his, uh, and Charlie had a full beard. And uh, we heard we were sitting, having something to drink, and Charlie had disappeared, but then he came, came back, and he said he had been detained by Franco's Guardia Seville for interrogation. But he, he was able to talk his way out of that. Uh, and anyway, I have no memory, actually, of running with the bulls, but I, I do remember that wine was eight cents a bottle at that time. Uh, Following that get-together, uh, we met up in southern Germany, and Charlie and I uh, drove down the Dalmatian coast to Dubrovnik, which was a very interesting area. And then we took a, uh, a boat ferry across to, uh, to Italy, Ancona, and we went to a wonderful opera, uh, Aida, at an outdoor amphitheater in Verona, and that was one of the most wonderful experiences I've ever had, uh, really the way that uh, opera's meant to be, meant to be performed. Uh, in more recent years, I had, after my daughter was born, we had the pleasure of, of renting Charlie and Putt's house in Nantucket for many years. I'm sure it was a below market rent that we paid. Uh, but but uh, three years ago, we, we had a uh, Williams alumni trip to Morocco, and Charlie was the one who encouraged me to go along on that trip. And, and if any, Charlie ever suggests a trip to any of you, take it. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the career that Charlie has had is, has been amazing. And uh, really, this is from what he has written in the class book, so I encourage you to, to read it. Uh, following graduation, Charlie taught at a private girls' school in Kansas City, and I believe that Steve Blackwell was with you uh, at that time, and Steve, who's, who's departed, unfortunately, but may have encouraged you to go to Kansas City. And then he, de he decided to enroll in the Fletcher School, uh, and where he got his MA in his PhD, but more importantly, that is where he met Putnam Mundy, whom he later married at a beautiful wedding that several of us attended in Lynchburg. Uh, so while he was doing his PhD, his focus was on the Angolan Civil War, and uh, I believe that he and Putt were managing a dormitory in exchange for free rent at that time. So uh, Charlie then joined the Federal Energy Administration, Office of International Affairs, and while there, he was involved in the formation of the International Energy in Agency in Paris, and he developed an interest in polar affairs. He also did a, an unsolicited study of China, and as a result of that, he was asked to join the consulting firm Conant & Associates by age 26, meeting leading European, Japanese, Middle Eastern oil and gas officials and executives of the world's leading energy companies. In 1979, asked by the Center for Strategic and International Studies 
conduct, could, to conduct a major study on the international politics of nuclear energy, which led him be, to him being considered an international expert on global nonproliferation and nuclear technology issues. He was then asked by the Asia Society and the Ford Foundation to conduct a study on how Pakistan, as a poor Asian nation, had been affected by the energy crises of 1973 and 1979, which led to a book and his involvement in every aspect of that country's energy policy for nearly 30 years for the World Bank, uh, also for the Asian Development Bank and the U.S. Agency for International Development, and also directly for the Pakistani government. From 1979 to 1988, as a result of the nuclear report's success, he was hired by the Center for Strategic and International Studies as the director of its energy program. While there, he wrote books on aspects of U.S. domestic policy, oil and gas price decontrol, export of Alaskan oil, nuclear waste management, ethanol and methanol competition as a gasoline additive, the import of Mexican and Canadian oil and gas, the geopolitical implications of Soviet sales of oil and gas to Western Europe, the electricity markets decontrol, liquid, liquid natural gas imports, and etc. He served on two presidential working groups trying to establish a truly bipartisan consensus on energy issues confronting the nation. In 1988, joined the consulting firm Putnam, Hayes, and Bartlett, where for the next year was involved in the many issues affecting the deregulation of natural gas and electricity markets in the U.S. and the United Kingdom. He then moved to the International Resources Group, a leading consulting firm for bilateral and multilateral aid agencies, where he was enjoying working on third world energy issues and the many economic and political development issues that he had studied at Fletcher. At the IRG, he ran the energy practice and progressed to executive vice president, and over the next 30 years had se held senior level, level positions at IRG, Stone and Webster Management Consultants, and Nexant, which is an offshoot of Bechtel. Charlie has worked in over 40 countries. During the last eight years of his career, he became the director of the Energy and National Security Program at Brookings. He also taught for 20 years at Georgetown School of Foreign Service and for 10 years at Johns Hopkins. Three of his students became the energy ministers of their countries. He is currently a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center. And he's written at least six books. I'll read them. Energy and Security in South Asia, Business and Nonproliferation, Political Terrorism and Energy, Pakistan Energy Planning in a Strategic Vortex, Banks, Petrodollars, and Sovereign Debtors, U.S.-Japanese Energy Relations. He currently is a board member of some energy companies, including North Coast Energy, the independent oil and natural gas producer, and Kokomo Gas and Fuel Company, which is a natural gas distribution company. He currently serves on the board of Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs and the Energy Research Institute of India. Putt and Charlie's daughter, Cheryl, who's a Williams alum, and her husband are practicing medicine in Maine, and they had a very heavy load, from what I understand, during the pandemic. Uh, they have two sons, one of whom is a rising senior, maybe headed for Williams Way, who knows? But uh, it's a great privilege uh, to introduce Charlie as our class speaker. Thank you, Ken, for that truly overly extended introduction, but very much, very much appreciated. And I'll tell you, if you ever need a wingman, this is the guy you want. Because what he didn't mention is that 
When we were in southern Germany, we went to the eagle's nest, you know, Hitler's redoubt. And a long line of, of people standing to buy tickets, and there was this one obnoxious little German boy that kept trying to dart in front of us. And finally, as I got up to buy the tickets, he tried to squirt in front of me, and I, I didn't really hit him, but I kind of pushed him aside. And his father in German, you know, I guess was back in the line and starts whoa, 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 in German. Of course, I don't understand it, but Ken does. And Ken retorts to him, and I said, and the guy goes ballistic. And I said, well, what did you say to him? He said, I told him if he didn't get his kid in line, next time we'd bring, bring back the RAF and do the job right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> a great wingman. <laughs> I want to share with you today some thoughts on energy and climate change. Those of you that had the good fortune uh, on some of our Zoom recordings, hearing some of our other classmates who have truly worked much more in the trenches uh, around the world in very difficult places. But my experience was different in that usually I was interacting with the highest level energy officials in the country advising them uh, on lots of issues, but just to give you context, most countries in the world, of course, particularly poor ones, usually have subsidized energy prices, which by the time I was doing this work had gotten a lot of these countries in very serious economic trouble because the subsidies were so, so substantial that it was, became impossible at some point in time to continue to build power plants and oil refineries and so forth <clears throat> to meet the needs because they simply couldn't afford to. And this was during the period when most of the international donor agencies were saying that the answer was to bring in the private sector, both the local private sector and the international private sector, to take over and try to clean it up. But of course, they were also advocating the immediate elimination of subsidies, groups like the IMF and the World Bank, which were usually politically unacceptable because there are no social safety nets for other things in these countries. And so when prices would be raised as a result of the international donors' pressure, uh, there were many times riots, governments actually were brought down on their knees a completely failed policy in my view, but it was one that dominated uh, international development circles for many years. And of course, when you said you wanted privatization, then you also needed the, the companies coming in to do these projects uh, wanted safety, wanted assurance that their investments would be secure, and so they had to create international regulatory regimes which created a whole new set of difficult issues. But what I want to talk to you today about is based on many experiences in many different countries, as Ken highlighted, what is happening with global climate change and what is happening in US climate change. I wish I thought I knew the answer and then of course, a few days ago, Mr. Manchin changed his position. <laughs> so. We'll get more to that, but all bets were off. It's easy to forget that it was nearly 30 years ago that the international community <coughs> first took climate change seriously, uh, forming the UN Convention on Climate Change in 1992. This was designed to give a pathway for countries to begin to address their emissions and other climate change policies and such as protecting forests, protecting watersheds, and so forth. This led in turn in 1997 to the passage of an historic agreement, the Kyoto Protocol, which for the first time set parameters for seven major greenhouse gases, but not carbon dioxide. Uh, and this too, I'm skipping a lot of things that happened in between, but by 2005, the formation of the Paris Accord, which became the first major international binding treaty uh, on climate change. Policies were let, 
were let out to provide money for poor countries to deal with their uh, climate change and energy issues. 196 countries signed the agreement. The target at that point in time, it was estimated that since the dawn of the industrial age, uh, temperatures had risen 1.1 degrees centigrade. The goal was to limit it to below 2 degrees centigrade. And most people agreed that even if you got to 1.5 degrees centigrade, it would be catastrophic for the global community. In 2012, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change launched a major report highlighting even more directly the major issues confronting the world relating to ecological damage, wildfires, heat waves, sea level rises, drought, disease, forests being devastated. Uh, and most recently, and very alarmingly in the last week or 10 days, the decision by the government of the Congo, Democratic Republic of the Congo to allow a bog area that's one of the great carbon sinks in the world to begin to be massively developed. For those of you unfamiliar with it, the Great Congo Rainforest and the Brazilian Rainforest are two of the major what we call carbon sinks in the world. And our, if, de if deforestation such as already occurred in Brazil and the Congo continues, it really won't make much of a difference what the rest of us do and things we can address in climate change because this could mean literally a 40 to 45 percent increase in emissions without those carbon sinks. As recently as November 2021, just a few months back, uh, a more positive assessment was released as this conference of parties met in Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, they said that technologies are available to stop climate change, but important caveat, there is no political will to do that. And that indeed, although methane gases could be cut uh, and we might achieve uh, uh, other, uh, other cutbacks in, in, in fossil fuels, the estimate was that on current tracks, temperature, if we do nothing now, on current tracks, the world will warm by 2.5 2.7 degrees centigrade by 2100, a number that simply would be devastating to the world community. Let's for a moment turn back to the United States because we have had such a transformation. We've all lived through it, but I bet some of you haven't really necessarily thought about it in these terms. In 2007, it was estimated that by a decade, we would be importing 40% of our natural gas. 40% imports. And as a result of this, the liquefied natural gas industry developed. These are these huge tankers, sometimes 1,000 feet long, that gasify uh, and then can transport internationally and then have it reliquified at the other end. And this was, we were going to receive need to receive seven, seven of these, build, excuse me, build seven of these in the United States uh, to take care of the imports that we were going to need. But by 2015, eight years later, the situation had completely changed. With the advent of so-called hydraulic fracking, uh, we all of a sudden had more gas than we knew what to do with. We had, from being a declining producer of oil, we all of a sudden had a tremendous oil industry boom. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, we become the first, the, the largest producer of oil in the world, the second largest producer of gas in the world. And what do we do about this? At the same time that, the, that we are expanding our energy so dramatically, the International Energy Agency and many other international groups are saying that to stop climate change, 
we must have fossil fuel usage not only peak, but then decline as we close down fossil fuel plants around the world. This was all maybe sound policy, but the reality is that we didn't know quite what to do. As part of this policy, the IEA also said that we have to reduce the, situ the automotive fleets so that 50% of new cars in 2035 are electric. Give, give a thought that today, worldwide, with all the talk about electric vehicles, today, electric vehicles are only 5% of the car fleet worldwide. And so we're talking about a huge jump that we would have to do, and all of a sudden, and also the issue of how many people are going to junk their old cars just to buy an electric because it's good for climate change. The staggering fact is that the IEA also estimated that to effect this change, it would cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $4 trillion per year. $4 trillion. Now, when President Biden came in, he issued what was probably the most far-reaching set of energy programs uh, that we could think of. And this, of course, followed President Trump, who pulled us out of the Par Paris Accord uh, and tried to open everything for more oil and gas drilling, wanted all the Atlantic coast open. He finally had to, Trump finally had to cave in Florida because his rich friends in Florida didn't want drilling off the coast of Florida. But nonetheless, when President Biden comes in, he closes down sensitive areas in the, in the Arctic, except for the small production at Cook Inlet. I uh, shut down drilling across the, uh, I mean, he, he had shut down drilling everywhere. President Biden shut down drilling on the Atlantic coast, the Pacific coast, and most of the Gulf Coast. Uh, and of course, this won the ire of the international oil industry that argued that this was an unsound policy. And yet, if we look at public opinion polls, 61% of Americans say they want to do more. 52% supported President Biden's original goals. 70% of corporations say they are willing to do their fair share. And 33% 33, 33 of the population in the United States say they are concerned and deeply alarmed by the threat of climate change. The problem is, when we talk about the energy transition, uh, we have two diverse views that seem to dominate the discussion. Some will argue that the energy transition requires a rapid phasing out of fossil fuels and the immediate scaling up of cleaner energy sources like wind, solar, and some people argue atomic power. I personally believe we need new small-scale reactors, but that is a very controversial position not endorsed by many people. Uh, others, however, in the oil and gas industries argue that no, what we need is regulations for oil and gas drilling, but certainly not rolling back fossil fuels, that simply renewables on a global scale are not yet at scale that we can close down all our fossil fuel, particularly power plants, and move on. Now, this was all, this was all good and a good, lively debate, and remains a good, lively debate, but then we had the Ukraine crisis, and the Ukraine crisis has completely upended the world of energy, and I would argue the world of climate change, at least in the near term. What a lot of people don't remember is that on the eve of the Russian invasion in February of this year, the oil and gas market was already quite tight in terms of supplies versus demand. Uh, COVID had had the effect of not only cutting back nearly two and a half million barrels worldwide on oil production because there was no market for it, but it, has, but it had also 
uh, that the industry to assess that long-term demand was probably not going to come back very fast. And so investments in new production were basically halted for nearly, for all intents and purposes, two years. So you had the combination of lack of investment, keeping new production when it would be needed going, and demand being cut because as industry was affected by COVID, there simply was no reason to produce if you were a producer. The other factors that people forget is that there was a large demand for oil because of an unusually hot season in Europe uh, and parts of the Arctic. We also, for reasons still not fully understood in the North Sea, where there are huge giant windmills, we had the situation where the wind wasn't blowing. And so we had a lot of wind capacity that simply wasn't there to, uh, to meet needs. We also had the fact that, the, that we had not built a new refinery in the United States for nearly 10 years, and we had actually closed down nine refineries, existing refineries, owing to environmental regulations that the owners of those refineries uh, believed did not, could not they could not make the investments because the refineries were old and they would never recover them. So essentially, you had a lack of refining capacity, which all these factors came together to lead to the huge escalation in gasoline prices that we've all seen around the country. We also had an added dimension. It seemed like a minor fact in itself, but in reality, a giant fire at the Freeport McMoran refinery in Texas one of the largest refineries in the world had a giant fire which closed that refinery uh, and made it non-available for a number of months <clears throat> to produce a wide variety of petroleum products. We also had some re additional refineries closing down because they were moving away from conventional petroleum production of gasoline, aviation fuel, and so forth, and converting to become biodiesel refineries because this was considered at the time uh, a much better environmental choice than the traditional refineries. We had regulatory delays, which always plagued the industry. Uh, and finally, we had, excuse me, surprisingly rapid, um, rapidly rising gasoline demand. The Ukraine crisis has hit us a number of fold, first and foremost because of the huge volume of gas, uh, natural gas that flows through the Ukraine from Russia to uh, Eastern and Western Europe. Uh, both Ukraine and Belarus are major producers of fertilizer and foodstuffs, and the loss and the cutoff of that export uh, to the rest of the world, it's affecting nearly 35% of the global population that potentially, I know an agreement has theoretically been made between the Russians and the Ukrainians to allow fertilizer and foodstuffs to be exported. Right after that agreement was made, the Russians attacked the port of Odessa, so it remains to be seen whether those agreements will remain in place. The World Bank estimates that because of the Ukrainian crisis, uh, there will be uh, 75 million people, additional people who may be threatened by food insecurity. And it's estimated that there may be as many as 250 million people in the world that now have no electricity because they have no power to generate it. It's, it's, it's nice to be able to say that we're going to uh, easily transition from an era of fossil fuels to an era of renewables, but there are really great challenges ahead. And they center first and foremost on the near complete domination in the world of China 
as a major producer of most solar parts and solar cells. 80% of all solar manufacturing occurs uh, in China. And ironically, because of trade disputes between the United States and China, uh, which have curtailed very important parts coming from China to U.S. solar manufacturers, 315 solar projects have been idled this year because of the trade dispute with China over getting these parts. China could also easily produce 95% of the world's polysilicon and solar wafers and 85% of all solar cells. So we have to ask ourselves and think seriously uh, about what are we going to do if by any chance in a trade war, not a, just a trade war, but an active war with China and Taiwan, what are we going to do if we don't have access to the solar pieces unless we truly develop a manufacturing capacity in this country for solar? There is no reason we can't do that. But the reason we don't do it is because our manufacturers are about 20 to 25 percent more expensive than Chinese parts. But if we see this truly as a national security issue, which I believe we should, uh, we've got to get off the dime and start building these facilities. But you don't build these overnight. You don't build any energy facility overnight. Uh, and this is the real problem that we need to ask for. We also, part of this trade dispute, the Chinese are very good about getting around trade disputes. So what they've done, they've moved a lot of solar manufacturing to nearby countries, Malaysia, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, and then try to circumvent that the, China, that the parts aren't really coming from China but are coming from those countries. But the U.S. has caught on to that and is taking steps to modify it. The other issue that nobody talks about is as we junk our conventional automobiles, there are very valuable minerals in those junk cars that are important for renewable energy. But here again, China has domination of critical mineral supply chains around the world on things like cobalt, lithium, manganese, silver, copper, nickel, graphite, all these things go into the production of renewable vehicles. And again, it's not that we don't have a lot of these minerals in the United States, but we either have not developed the mines for local or national environmental reasons. Uh, nobody likes mines. <laughs> nobody likes mines in their backyard. But on the catalytic converters, uh, there's a tremendous market for recycling those materials into renewable energy. But the question is, what do we do then with all the junk vehicles after we've extracted the minerals? Because some of those minerals uh, are very lethal, lithium being the first and foremost. The other country that's never thought about very much on climate change, one I've spent years in, uh, is India. We've, most people don't realize that in just a few years, India will actually have more people than China. Currently, India represents 18% of the world's population. But amazingly, despite its huge use of coal, only 3% of greenhouse gas emissions. But think about what happens if, with only 8% of the population of India having access to an air conditioner, think of what happens if a billion two people all of a sudden want air conditioning. And if you follow the news, India has had the worst heat waves in a generation. Uh, we also have the fact that 90% of the vehicles in China, again, owned roughly by 12% of the population. Um, 
run on gasoline or diesel. If any of you have been in India recently, the air pollution is unbearable. And particularly cities like New Delhi and Mumbai and Bangalore are simply environmental disasters. It's estimated that currently India has 30 million vehicles. It's estimated that in 10 years they're going to have a billion vehicles. Now what those vehicles run on is, is critical if we're going to have any serious discussion about climate change. India continues to say they're doing great things in renewable energy, and they are. It's just that the demand is so great that it gets swallowed up uh, in terms of having any real short-term impact. India says they need another 500 gigawatts, gigawatts of electricity by 2030, but it's estimated that on current trends, 80% of that will be coal barring a major transformation of Indian policy. Let me conclude by saying it's great news that Senator Manchin may be on board. Those of you who have read the New York Times in the last several days see even some major environmental leaders, the Sierra Club and elsewhere, are, are saying this would be a good bill what Manchin has agreed to. But there are some caveats if you look at something he said. He said he's going to hold out for another bill that deals with the crux of the matter, which is unfortunately most of our solar capacity is located miles from where it's actually used. And as a result, we have to build or, or connect with long distance transmission, electric transmission lines in order to get the power moved. If anybody knows how difficult it is to build a transmission line in this country, the average new transmission line in this country takes 12 to 13 years to get built. And that's largely because of legal suits against them, sometimes rights of way through Indian reservations, um, concerns about pipelines crossing rivers and potentially leaking. The, the issues are, are legion and many. But the reality is we don't build those long distance transmission lines. Uh, we aren't going to be able to have the solar resources that we need. Let me just share one anecdote for you. I must say I had days in my career and when you're in some poor country, uh, you're advising, you think, you think you're advising the right thing, but it's not happening, uh, largely for political reasons in the host country. But one day, I, near the end of my active career, I was working in Liberia. And Liberia, for those of you that don't know, was at that time, just a few years ago, coming out of the worst, one of the worst civil wars ever anywhere. Millions of people killed, but most importantly, the electric system was completely destroyed. From the headquarters building to the lines to the center of Monrovia, the capital, the only people that had electricity were a few wealthy people that could afford independent generators. But one day, part of our job was to rebuild the system. And my technical guys that know how to do that, I don't. But one day I said, I want to go out with you. I want to see, you know, you as you move through a neighborhood, what it means. And I get out and this little kid in rags comes up. And he says, hello, Mr. Light Man. He says, big grin on his face, he says, you're going to bring me electricity so I can read at night. And we can refrigerate stuff. And so forth and so forth. And I went back to, to our office and I turned to my colleagues and I said, you know, with all the frustrations we have of not getting stuff done that we think ought to be done, this is why we are here. That little boy, what electricity can do to change those people's lives is incalculable. 
absolutely incalculable. Now, I want to save time for questions, and I know we have some from discussions the last day or two, I know we have some climate deniers, <laughs> and I know we have some people who are real activists at the local level, which is, God, God bless them, that's where we need to be. But just a few funny anecdotes of things I encountered during the course of my career. Ken mentioned I did my PhD dissertation in Angola, 1975, in their civil war. I was befriended by a by a French businessman and another fellow, and we went swimming. Rwanda has the most beautiful beaches south of it. We went swimming every day, and it has hills above the beach, and there are all these little kids there waving at us, and we thought, oh, what friendly children there are in this country. And then we finally discovered, after doing this for days, that those are some of the most shark-infested waters in the world. <laughs> and they were telling us to get the hell out. <laughs> another, another funny story is getting off the airplane at Heathrow. And as has happened so many times at Heathrow, somebody's on strike. And that day it was the guys that brought out, you know, the, the jetway that would take you to the terminal, so they brought out the old steps that you had to go down. I have this old woman coming down behind me, and she falls. And somehow she managed to get her thumb right in my pants pocket. And she literally ripped my trousers down to my ankles. <laughs> and I, I'm walking through the terminal flapping my underwear. And I get up to customs and this very wonderful British elderly gentleman, the customs officer says, sir, I believe you need a tailor. Well, I, I seem to have trouble keeping my pants on on, on another occasion. I, this book on Pakistan, I present, I was, once a month I had to produ present a chapter uh, up at the Ford Foundation in New York, and they had a study group that would critique it. And it was customary, maybe 20 people around a long table, but it was customary for the person making the presentation to stand while you made your opening remarks. As I get up, the crotch of my suit goes out. I mean, I mean just out. <laughs> it's my pants just split. So I kind of had to signal to Ambassador Ellsworth, who was chairing the meeting, that maybe it'd be all right if I sat down. <laughs> and then somebody found some safety pins during the break, and we, we saved that day. And just, and just one more. Uh, my wife goes crazy with this one. In work in Pakistan, up in Peshawar, which is the gateway to the famous Khyber Pass, we had a, had a very good graduate school friend who comes from one of the leading families up there. And I was visiting, and on a Saturday night, three of his friends who were Air Force officers, because that's where the Pakistani Air Force is based. We were all riding around, and of course, Pakistan, you can't see any girls. They're not, they're home. So these guys, you can't drink. So these guys are just cruising, because they're bored as hell. Uh, and one of them says, let's go up to my village. And I go, where are your village? He goes, well, a third way up the Khyber Pass. The Khyber Pass is one of the most dangerous places uh, for, for generations. But he said, it's no problem. You know, the, 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 I said, there are guards there. You know, they don't let us through. It's closed at night. Oh, the guards know me. It'll be fine. So, and we'll go, to, we'll go to this remote village and buy booze. I said, booze? Oh, big warehouse up there. So we're driving up the, the main road, which isn't much of a road. And then all of a sudden, we take off overland. And they say to me, you just sit in the middle of the back seat and don't say anything. So we stop in the village. The villages all have slits for guns to shoot across the street at their neighbors, needless any outsider. Uh, and we go, into the, we go into the village. They have a conversation. Then we drive to the end of the village. I am not kidding you. This warehouse 
would make any warehouse in New York or Washington or San Francisco. It had every kind of booze, every kind made. And so they buy a bottle of scotch for like $80. And they're looking at it by candlelight to make sure it isn't adulterated. And I go, yeah. So we get back in the car and, he, and the guys, I, I said, you guys are really smart. You know, those guys, we have to go back to the border. And those guys are going to stop us. And at best, we'll be lucky if they just take the booze. But God knows what they might do. And then my heart sang when he said, it's no problem, Charlie. We're not stopping at the border. So we come down near the border and they rev the engine and we go through the little gateway they have into Pakistan. <laughs> A memorable experience. Anyway, enough anecdotes. We want to save some time for questions. So uh, be delighted to take any from the floor. <laughs> Anybody? I can't see real well, so. Bill. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I have not I have not seen anything concrete, but that's an excellent question. Because obviously if we start talking about really cataclysmic uh, events happening, uh, particularly in large populated areas of the world, it would be the cost would be staggering. But I have not seen anything. Sorry. Bill? Terry, thank you so much. You highlighted how difficult this transition or global transition may be. What, what are your thoughts about trying to use it as an opportunity to do true international uh, economic development in Africa and India and so forth to try to come up with more effective and efficient sources of energy over a long period, it's going to take 30 years or more to develop that. And not only you talked about the problems of solar panels, but you didn't, I don't think you mentioned the rare earths, which are critical to uh, semiconductors. And that's, I think, 95% in out of China at the moment. And so how do you think there's a capability out of the UN or some other body that could look at a long-term systems approach where looking for win-win solutions? Because right now, we tend to be focused on win-lose or lose-lose. So I just was interested in your thoughts about opportunities and in particular what you could do in Africa and India and other parts of South Asia. It's estimated, amazingly, that for every megawatt of renewable energy that we might develop in this country, that it could provide as many as 13, a whole supply chain could supply as many as 1,300 jobs, one megawatt. So when you start talking about thousands of megawatts in terms of the US, uh, this could be, we could transform the economy, uh, theoretically. <laughs> But then you get the issue of stranded assets. And stranded assets, for those of you that don't know that in economic terms, you know, are things that are built. The developers have an expectation to recover the costs over a certain period of time. But all of a sudden, you say, you can't, you can't build that kind of plant. And so they've already got this albatross. Uh, and it gets very political, because of course, the people that work in the conventional uh, plant uh, lose their jobs. But Bill's point is well taken. I've asked myself obviously this question many times and it's sad to say at a, at a macro basis I'm very pessimistic. And it's not because we can't do it, it's not because the technology isn't there. It's the political will. And I mean you have such corruption in these countries. Uh, I could count on one hand the countries that I worked in 
that weren't corrupt at some level of the supply chain. And it's very, very disheartening. It's not a good answer to your question. Uh, Africa is particularly a problem. Uh, I don't know why, but I mean, even, even by third world standards, the corruption in Africa is worse than say in, in Asia or Latin America. Sorry, it's not a good answer. Uh, I echo Bill's thanks for your talk. Um, on a related question, can you perhaps survey region by region around the world what are the obstacles to uh, increasing the role of nuclear power? I don't believe that anyone will ever build, I shouldn't say ever build, but I don't believe many people would build a conventional large-scale nuclear plant like 12, 900, 1200 megawatts, <coughs> which they were historically, most of them. But when you talk about small modular reactors that can be built much, uh, much more attuned to the, particularly in a third world country, Bill Vassy, that could be much more relevant for a small grid, something like 50 or 100 megawatts, <coughs> that already has a lot of people looking at that. Bill Gates is, uh, Bill Gates is supporting a, a major effort for a small modular reactor that he's going to test market in China. And now, test market in China. Why is Bill Gates going to test a new technology in China? What would you guess? It's because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in Washington won't license it. I mean, won't license it. Why? Uh, but if you looked at modular reactors around the world, I think there are about there are probably more, but I think the ones I can immediately think of are probably 15 to 20 plants under some kind of R&D effort. And I believe, they, I believe not only that they will be developed, but I think they're a necessity to develop. <clears throat> now, I know you'll have people say, you, the minute you mention atomic power, there's just some people that don't want to hear about it. It just simply is unsafe. <clears throat> they are not unsafe. They can be built passively, what's called passively safe, and I think they will be a big thing. But they, but they aren't going to do anything on a, on a major scale globally for a, a decade, a decade or more. So in terms of, we always hear we're getting to, we have got these goals by 2030, we've got these goals by 2050. Well, you know, we don't have 10 years. To, I mean, it's not we can't do it and be doing something else too. But we don't have 10 years or 15 years for a totally new technology to be developed. We have to act now. And that's why I personally still believe the greatest thing we can do as a world is <clears throat> energy efficiency. There is no reason why every major building in this country shouldn't be retrofitted with state-of-the-art energy efficiency. And in much of Europe and Asia too. Uh, but there again, often the prices don't justify the economics of it. But it's not the economics that we need to worry about at this point. We need the political will. We need to be prepared to pay 20 to 30 percent more if we want clean energy today. Uh, we can have it. But we don't want to pay that. Nobody wants to pay that. <clears throat> Nobody wants to pay for gasoline. What it costs today. I, I, I hurt too when I have to pay five bucks a gallon for gasoline. <laughs> but give me, an alter give me a near-term alternative that you can build at scale. Scale is the critical thing. Yep. Charlie, um, it's such a simplistic question, but I think that all of us, I feel such a sense of helplessness. You know, I write my Congress person, I'm from Tennessee, it's not very effective. <laughs> but, you know, here we are, what, what is your advice to the common person in this country, in our little towns? Um, you know, I always hear 10 years, we have to do it now. What can I do now? I mean, what can we be doing now to affect any change when You can start, and it's not, it's not you know, an individual action you won't be able to show had great impact. But it does if millions of people do it. 
If any time you need to build, buy an appliance for your home of any kind, make sure you build one that has state, the best state-of-the-art technology on the market today. If you, haven't, if, you, if you have an ancient air conditioner and you can afford a new one, they are 30, 40 percent more efficient than the ones many of us probably have in our homes. Again, it costs money, though. Uh, energy efficiency, if you haven't ever insulated your home as best as you can, do it. Uh, but gasoline prices are set in a world market, and there's nothing we can do. When the president said, well, we're, I might rescind the gasoline tax, 18.4 percent. I mean, 18.4 cents is the gasoline, federal gasoline tax, and then there's a state gasoline tax. <clears throat> but even if the, each state and the federal were reduced, you're probably going to see 30 or 40 cent reduction per gallon. Now, for a lot of people, that's a lot of money, and I don't underestimate that. But it's not a cure-all. Uh, and, and also, the problem is, if you lower the price, what happens when you lower the price? Demand goes up. <laughs> So you might offset the rising demand by setting off the gasoline price. Uh, the, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which I actually helped set up to some extent, was set up as exactly that, a strategic petroleum reserve. So if oil got cut off from the Middle East or whatever else, we would have it we would have it to use. But when the president says, well, I'm going to draw down a million barrels a day from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, you can't burn crude oil. You have to turn it into gasoline or diesel or aviation fuel or lubrication products. And in the best of circumstances, being charitable, a barrel of oil taken out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve might hit the market in two and a half to three months. And yet, you know, if you're trying to do something that's visible and Americans can say the president did that and it's really helpful tomorrow, it's not the way it works. Yeah, thanks, uh, Charlie, for delivering on your topic, which is uh, are we out of time on climate or on uh, energy and climate? I think the answer clearly is, yeah, uh, we've waited too long. But turning to what you know has been echoed by several other questioners, what can we do? You mentioned national security. If, and you mentioned politics, certainly, if we were to decide as a country that this is a wartime situation, that we've got to do, apply all of our resources towards this end, what what, what then could be accomplished? And what would be your priority list of what we could do as a nation, understanding that we still have some leadership in the world? I don't believe personally that the declaration of a national energy emergency, which is being talked about as an executive action by the president, I don't personally think it will do very much. <coughs> Although, clearly, if, if as part of that declaration you had much higher tax incentives for renewables or for electric cars or so forth, that might have some impact, but not in, a, in an immediate time frame, I don't believe. Um, the president, you know, we've got to get rid of coal. And thus we find a way to prove that carbon, what's called carbon capture and sequestration, where you ca capture the CO2 as it comes out of the plant. Unless we can prove that and make it work, uh, <clears throat> that's not going to do anything really for, for coal in the near term. But we still get nearly 20% of our electricity from coal. And last year at a global level, coal usage was the highest it's ever been, ever been. And last year, on a global level, CO2 emissions were the highest they've ever been. Despite all these efforts around the world to do things, we're, we're, losing, we're losing the battle. Uh, again, I would, I would think the president could put in more incentives for uh, 
energy efficiency. You could mandate, you know, mandate certain appliances, not allow people to buy stuff that's not energy efficient. But you'll have a hue and cry from the National Manufacturers Association and other special and other special interests. That's why I'm very pessimistic. And I'm most pessimistic, not that I think the U.S. won't do something important, but I'm not sure it really makes any difference if China and India and Brazil and the Congo go about their way. It doesn't really matter. I mean, I mean, of course it matters, but it doesn't matter in the sense of thinking we're going to solve the problem, because we aren't. The Congo rainforest is one of the last great sinks, and if it's gone, God help us. Not a good answer. Um, I've been in the meetings with a local climate group. Um, I think they're a part of a national organization, but they are convinced that the carbon tax and the dividend that goes to the public from the carbon taxation is the best answer right now. How do you feel about it? I'm a strong supporter of a carbon tax and a dividend, but um, I think it'd be very, very hard to get the votes in the Congress to support it. But it, it is at least a way of making people realize when they use carbon what, what it's costing and if you can dividend it back. But then you get a question, should it be a dividend back to everybody or should it be means tested? Uh, and it would be a lot, it would require a lot of money. A carbon tax has to be really high to attract the kind of dollar volumes you're talking about. And that itself will be political, because even if people think they're getting a rebate down the road, if I got to pay it today, <coughs> how does that work? with recommendations. That's not, that's studies. I'm talking about is there a group that's looking at putting in place actual capability to handle certain, you know, Not to my not. No, I can't think of anything like that. But, but the studies, I mean, excuse me, I'm sorry. Is there a policy that might possibly gain support in Congress across the board to have a female-like capability uh, looking forward? Not that I'm aware. Sorry. And I have Yeah. Not to continue with the pessimistic mode, but you mentioned China, Brazil, other countries, and obviously climate change. The U.S. is being solved or something now. And somebody is curious as to your statistics on this, but some huge percentage of the uh, greenhouse gases are produced in places like China, Africa. So the U.S. is, what, 20%? Uh, uh, so even if we eliminated ours altogether, it's still uh, 80% going And think of... And th And think about, nobody, I haven't heard anybody ask this question, but think about the Middle East, the major oil and gas producers in the Middle East. What do you think they're going to do if all of a sudden they really think they're being truly challenged by renewables elsewhere? They're going to cut their prices. 
because those countries have nothing without oil and gas. And you talk about stranded assets, you think Saudi Arabia is going to sit back and let the world destroy the demand for oil before they take some kind of dramatic action? I don't think so. Russia, Russia has nothing except oil, gas, and coal exports. If fossil fuels go the way that we'd like them to, Russia has nothing. They are no longer a great power except for their nuclear weapons. And they will have absolutely no way to generate money to turn around their economy. And I think this is why Putin is so, so scared. Uh, that if he loses this one, uh, and Europe's, Europe's beginning to diver, try to diversify away from Russian oil and gas and coal, it's not going to happen tomorrow. But if they really put in the policies they're already saying, and they have cut back significantly on what they buy from Russia already, but if they really say, we're never going in five years, ten years, we're never going to buy another molecule of energy from Russia, bye-bye, Putin. Uh, I mean, we need to think about that because they have nothing, and the Arabs have nothing if oil and gas are phased out in the rest of the world. I think there were some in the back, right? Oh, thank you. Charlie, uh, this is going to be simplistic, but Mr. Lightman, at the end of your talk, do you have anything to give us for our grandchildren that's hopeful? I know you're a pessimist. I understand why. Is there anything hopeful that you can give us to walk out of this beautiful place with? Electricity. Electricity, in the third world, but in all countries, the advent of electricity for the first time is the greatest changing mo moment of a nation's life. Because for the first time in a poor country, a woman doesn't have to walk down three hours to the nearest river and then haul up water. They can put in an electrical pump crops that rot in the field because they have no storage capacity and the truck that comes gets it gets blocked by an avalanche or something, the crops ruin. If they have electricity in the village, they can store the crops until they get the transportation. Reading at night, probably the most important. Kids go home in the third world without electricity, they can't read at night. I remember I was in Morocco with a class, graduate's classmate of mine, who was the mission director for AID in Morocco. We're driving in this ridiculous superhighway from the airport in the city, four lanes. You go, he goes, why did they have this? Big lights, thousands of kids sitting under the lights on the traffic because they could read and study at night. And it goes, it goes on and on what electricity means when it comes to a village. Now, I know for your own kids, that may not, we're not talking about a, a village that has no electrification. One thing you can teach them is to turn out the damn lights and other electronic appliances when they aren't using them. It drives me nuts when I go in a home and see five televisions on and all the computers not turned off. And I mean, that, you don't, people don't realize how much energy their appliances use even when they aren't using them if they're plugged in. Uh, and just to learn, think about the energy usage every time you do something. It's not a good answer, Julie. All in the back? I'm sorry, I can't see who it is. Jerry. Ah. <laughs> well, Bill, Bill Watt and I have discussed this before. <laughs> You know, the joke about fusion is that the technology that's only 30 years away, only it's always 30 years away 30 years later. Uh, but I believe in fusion. I think, it, you know, theoretically it's possible. It's been done on a very limited scale in, in the laboratory. But um, I think if we were really looking at it, to think that it could make a transformation 40 years, 50, Bill says 50 at best. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that, but he says for 50 years it's been 
70 years, it's been 50 percent. Actually, people don't like to hear it, but I would bet, I would bet on uh, carbon capture and sequestration. I think, I think we'll be able to do that. Uh, it'll be expensive, uh, but I think if we can do that and, and then have a technology that we can sell around the world, that would do more for climate change if we could put all the CO2 from existing big industrial plants and power plants uh, and have the, the carbon capture. Now, there are big issues apart from just capturing it. You got to transport it, and, and that means pipelines that have to be built for CO2, which are expensive. And again, people don't want pipelines running across their land or near their home. But those issues aside, I think from a technological standpoint, it's very, very viable. And, I, and I'd be totally remiss if I didn't say battery storage. If we can find a way to seriously store large volumes of wind and solar uh, for usage when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing, uh, that would go a long, long way. A long, long way of making renewables much, much more viable. Time for one more question. All right, thank you. Other than some islands or microcosms, is there any political system in our world that is an example for moving in the right direction? I'm sorry, I can't, I couldn't hear the question. Other than some small islands or microcosms, is there any larger political system in the world where, where it's moving in the right direction, where there, where there might be an example for how it ideally would get done? I, I, no, I would say Denmark. Denmark has done an incredible things with wind power. I think they're now up to 40 percent thereabouts uh, with wind. Um, that's quite that's quite an accomplishment. Um, but let me think of who else. The, the problem, you, you know, people used to talk about big hydro, like Nepal has so much hydro capacity that they can't use, but could export to India. But now you have the issue, the glaciers are melting. So you're gonna build a multi-billion dollar dam uh, and all of a sudden not have the water source there in 10 years because of climate change. So hydro around the world is getting rethought, uh, particularly if they're in any remote locations that are subject to you know, rapid melting. But, but that is one of the most staggering facts you can think in your life. Hydro, if hydro power is not available from Nepal and Bhutan to the subcontinent of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, those countries die. That is their water supply. There is outside desalination, which probably wouldn't work on a mass, massive scale. There is no water in a part of the world that's going to have a fourth to a third of the population. And that is on track to happen. That is on track to happen now. Well, I know we're running over time, so. We'll do one more question, Tom. Thank you, Thank you for your keen insights, Charlie. I've, when you, I've never heard you mention nature-based solutions. I mean, everything I hear is high-tech kind of thing. These operations in Iceland to take. So even, even if we left all the coal and gas and uh, oil in the ground uh, and switched over to renewable energy, and, and, and I hope this bill this week get, will, will work toward that a lot. Uh, we still have to take a heck of a lot of greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. And these high-tech approaches are terribly expensive. And as you mentioned, you still have the transmission problem if you take methane and carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But nature-based solution, am I being naive? I'm putting all, not almost all the eggs in my local basket in nature-based solutions. We, we heard uh, Professor Muma talk about proforestation, letting old forests grow older as being much more effective than planting trees. We can't, we can't plant enough trees, new trees. Mangara, Matai, you know, not with sandy. We can't do it, so, but leaving existing trees to grow older uh, you know, it offers a lot, but also just other means of sequestering by plants and trees into the, into the soil. Is that, why, why hasn't that come up? Why have you brought that up? Are you, is that not, not really something? 
trees, you're absolutely right, old trees are m much more important than, than new trees. But the reality is, in most of the world where there are still giant forests, and particularly in the, in the rainforest area, there simply is not the policing capacity to stop the illegal logging, which is legendary, and particularly in a place like Brazil. Uh, and you probably saw a few weeks ago those three people that, those two guys that were in trying to monitor what was going on with the illegal foresting were, were murdered in Brazil. Uh, these are gangsters. Uh, same, thing, same thing is true in Indonesia. Indonesia's got phenomenal forest trees, but they're being denuded at an incredible rate. Uh, illegal logging uh, and no plans to protect the big forests. And of course, that's also killing most of the wildlife in Indonesia. So, so I, ocean thermal is something people talk about from time to time, but I don't know that there's a commercial, is there a commercial plant? I don't think there's a commercial plant anywhere in the world. But using the current uh, for power generation uh, could help. A lot of these things could help at a small, you know, even if it's a small scale level, magnified by 10 or 12 projects, it can be, it can be significant. But we just use so much energy. I don't think any of us realize how much energy. Just in oil, we use 100 million barrels a day of oil in the world. And people forget, if you're using 100 million, and you aren't drilling and producing new oil, at some point that goes down and then you have shortages of, of oil, shortages of oil going to refineries, higher gasoline prices, and it's a vicious cycle. Anyway, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie.